Tiki Hut Media. Hey there, welcome to Soul Ramblings Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Wicker. On Soul Ramblings, this is where we talk about faith and life, and we're not afraid to do so. A lot of times people are afraid to talk about their faith. We don't, we don't shy away from it here on Soul Ramblings. Coming to you from Manatee Life Church, a multicultural United Methodist community of faith in Bradenton, Florida. I'm the lead minister over there. Today, we continue with week number four of learning the Jesus way of life. And this is from Pentecost Sunday. And it's called, Who's First? Who do we put first in our life? We got that coming up here in the next few minutes. One day, Jesus' disciples got into an argument over Who among them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Silly sounding debate, and yet not unlike our world today. We still jockey for position, want to seem important, compare ourselves to other people, and imagine that there is some universal human ranking system that we want to score well on. We measure our relative importance in in foolish ways. How much money we have, how many likes we get on social media, how busy we are, how many square feet our house has, how important our job seems to be. If you stop long enough to think about these things for more than just a few minutes, you realize it's just plain silly. As the disciples arguing over who is the greatest, they were just more explicit about it. Jesus heard the disciples arguing and As is often the case, he didn't address their stupidity directly. Instead, he invited a child to come into their midst. In the ancient Near East, children weren't fawned over the way they are sometimes today. There was little sentimentalism when it came to children. They were not really to be seen or heard. In the perceived social ranking of the day, children were actually near the bottom. But Jesus brings the child close to a place of prominence and then says in Matthew 18, 3 and 4, I assure you that if you don't turn your lives around and become like this little child, you will definitely not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those who humble themselves like this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So in two sentences, Jesus challenges the way we try to rank ourselves, calls into question what's really important, and gives us something to think about. What does it mean to be like a little child, to become like a little child? Could it be that we need to recover awe and wonder at the simple, everyday miracles of life? I believe so. And who has top priority? Who is first in our lives? Let's go to the sanctuary from Pentecost Sunday. This is Who's First. Our scripture reading for the morning is from the second chapter of Acts, the first 15 verses. Let us hear these holy words. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galilean? And how is it that we hear each, and each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, 
standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. O Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. A couple of things. First of all, you probably do not care about this at all, but somebody had made a comment to me before church started this morning. And she said, you know, it used to be common practice in the United Methodist Church that after or after Memorial Day, the especially here in Florida, the pastors, the ministers didn't wear the robes throughout the summer because of the heat. I am here to tell you that we are going to observe that after today. <laughs> I thought I can make it to Pentecost. I can make it to Pentecost. Last week, I wondered. It is, it is awfully hot. But next week, no more robes for the summer. So, just because I'm sweltering. Second of all, in that scripture reading, I don't know about you, but and I usually try not to compliment myself, but I thought I did a pretty good job on all of those tough names. When I first picked out the, the scripture, of course, for Pentecost, and I got to reading over those, I said, oh, this is going to take some practice. Phrygia, Phrygia? never heard of it. But yes, a lot of names in the midst of that account. The other is this, and I did this on purpose because this is just my, just my sense of humor. I thought, and I saw a few of you smirk when I did it, I ended purposefully on verse 15 where Peter says, These are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now I know some of you will go so. That's another sermon for another time. And I'll see you in my office this week. We can talk about that. But there are many times that there's this thing that advertisers absolutely love, and it's when their product becomes what is referred to as branded. And here's an example of branding. If I'm preaching a just moving sermon on a Sunday morning, and you're just, you're just overcome with emotion, and you're brought to tears, you reach for a Kleenex. Tissue is what it is, but we refer to it as Kleenex. I need a Kleenex. If we have a runny nose. I need a Kleenex, right? All Kleenex is tissue, but not all tissue is Kleenex. When our children, or even us, get a cut or a scrape, we go to the closet to get a you get a bandage. Band-Aid is the brand name. But we call it, it's been branded. We all call it a Band-Aid, don't we? I need a Band-Aid. And if you're hurt bad enough, you really don't care what it's called, just get me one, right? Clorox, well, that might work. <laughs> Bleach, that's a, thank you, I didn't even think of that one. That's better than the one I had. Clorox. Are you going to use bleach or are you going to use Clorox? Clorox is branded. The one where I am from, whenever we go to a restaurant or fast food drive through and we have a soft drink, we say, I want a burger and a Coke. It doesn't matter if it's Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, 7-Up, Mountain Dew. It's all Coke. Coke has been branded. And something similar has happened with the word Pentecost. For many, when we say Pentecost, many think of those who worship as Pentecostals. 
And these are the people, if you've never been to a Pentecostal service, I highly suggest it. It is, it is, they wave their hands, they run up and down the aisles, they speak in tongues. It's uh, interesting times. And that's where a lot of people's minds go when you say Pentecost, to Pentecostals. And in the same way that Kleenex derives its meaning from facial tissue. Band-Aid refers or derives their meanings from bandage strips. Or Clorox derives their identity through bleach. Or Coke derives its identity as a soft drink. We might forget that all Christians, not only those who call themselves Pentecostals, but you and me as well, derive our meaning from that very first Pentecost. And we may forget as well just what Pentecost itself originally was and meant. For a first century Jew, Pentecost was the 50th day after Passover. Passover was the time when lambs were sacrificed and the Israelites were saved by putting the blood of that sacrificed lamb over the doorposts of their homes. And then, that very night, the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, and they escaped Egyptian captivity. Then, 50 days after Passover, the Israelites came to Mount Sinai, where Moses was given the law, the Ten Commandments. And that is what the festival of Pentecost originally signified. It was about God giving God's redeemed people the way of life by which They were to carry out God's purposes. Now, of course, Jesus was crucified during Passover. You remember Monday, Thursday of Holy Week, they were having what is referred to as the Last Supper, Passover. They were having the Passover meal. Forty days later, after Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose from the dead, Forty days later, he ascended back to heaven, promising to send the Holy Spirit on his waiting disciples. And then ten days after that, which is where we are today, the festival of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection. The Holy Spirit came on those who believed. As a result, to all who call on the name of Jesus to be saved, to all who follow him, to all who trust him, the Holy Spirit comes on each person beginning the process of making us into a new creation modeled after our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's exciting, exciting stuff. I can only imagine what it must have been like to be in that original upper room. It's been said that Pentecost is the event that created the Christian church or the church's birthday, if you will. And it puts God's saving acts into motion through Jesus Christ. It also explains how a small group of frightened, puzzled, largely uneducated men and women could so quickly become a force to be reckoned with throughout the known world. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church is born and is given the authority to proclaim the gospel of the risen Christ to the very same people who had put him to death. What are we to make of all this? Well, let's back up. Let's start with some of Jesus' teaching. I believe Matthew 6 will help us answer that, what we're to make of it. So let's start here and get a foundation. And by the way, this is the fourth week of learning to live the Jesus way of life. And today is who's first. Jesus helps us answer that. As we see in the message paraphrase of Matthew 6, verse 34, Jesus says this, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Keep that phrase in mind. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. You probably know that verse more traditionally as, Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. 
but give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. So if we look back at the entire Sermon on the Mount, it's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I encourage you to go back and read those three chapters in Matthew. Jesus gives us some great ways to stay focused on him and put him first and give our entire attention to what God is doing. The first is this, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is, by the way, the fill-in on your insert if you're following along. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got to recognize that we're all sinners, we're all messed up, we're all imperfect people, and we need Jesus to save us. The second is this, worship God with your whole life. You see, worship is not just something that happens once a week at 1030 on Sunday mornings. Worship is putting him first in every aspect of our lives seven days a week. And we worship and honor God when we seek him in prayer before making an important decision. We worship and honor God by taking time out of our day to read his word and commune with him. We worship God at any point that we put him first over everything else. And the third point Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount as a way of putting God first and focus on what God is doing, is make community a priority. Jesus knew the importance of surrounding himself with a good community who would work alongside, push his mission forward. And ultimately, the disciples would go on to do even more things than Jesus Jesus did while he was on earth. So just as Jesus had a community and knew the importance of it, we need a community. So that's the basis. Make sure God is first. God is top priority. A relationship with him is what matters. So after Jesus ascended into heaven, we talked about this a little bit last week on Ascension Sunday. Jesus ascended into heaven. About 120 men and women, his followers, gathered together in one place. They had been instructed to stay in Jerusalem until they were clothed, with power from on high. And so, stay put, they did. They were in an upper room. Door closed and locked. Shutters are drawn. After a while, things get pretty stuffy in there. The group gets kind of restless. Somebody says, let's have a business meeting, because even though the church wasn't organized yet, or even the Holy Spirit had not come yet, Even those disciples knew the blessing of a great, important business meeting. But they had to replace Judas. That was business that was at hand. And so after the nominating committee decided on Matthias to replace Judas, the disciples felt paralyzed. I mean, what was their purpose now? I mean, we did the business that was before us. Now what? What next? Who are we now that Jesus was gone? We're followers without a leader, disciples without a teacher. We're a congregation without a church. So they waited some more behind those locked doors, drawn shutters, unsure who to be, where to go, what to do. But just when those gathered disciples were reaching the point, the point of, I'm sure, boredom, deciding things were just going to be like this forever, God came to them. God showed up, rushing into the walls of their upper room, knocking the shutters off the windows and the hinges off the door with this mighty gust of wind, Scripture says. Flames dance above their heads like tongues of fire. And with eyes wide open, knees knocking, these disciples began to speak. And Scripture tells us that as they spoke, it was as if the walls of the room melted away. All of a sudden, people began to gather from all over. 
drawn by the sound of their native tongues. Thousands of them began to flock together to listen to see what these fiery preachers had to say. And each of them could understand the sermons perfectly. They each came from different lands. They spoke different languages, yet they were all hearing these sermons perfectly in their own native tongue. Now, we don't know exactly what all the disciples said. The Bible doesn't really give us any specifics, but we do know that they spoke about the wonders of God, proclaiming the good news in a way that each person could hear and understand. And then, of course, as there always seems to be, the naysayers, the mocking mob in the streets, they sneer. And it's just like Jesus is still with them. They're drunk. And then Peter goes out and addresses this crowd and says, Oh, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Peter. Peter did this. Remember Peter? from Monday, Thursday, at the Last Supper. He says, Oh, Jesus, I'll speak up for you. You can count on me. I'm with you to the very end. Then, shortly after that, some powerless handmaid shuts him up pretty quickly when she said, you were, you were with the Galilean, weren't you? Peter mumbles, curses. I hardly even knew him. He would go on two more times to deny Jesus. And now, in Acts, Peter is preaching. And I've got to be honest with you. This is probably one of the worst sermons in church history. I mean, it is unbelievably, ridiculously short. I know you guys would love a short sermon. But it is ridiculously short. There, he uses no illustrations. He doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation with all the bullet points. No cultural relativity, no intellectual foundation, no connections being made, no bridge from there to here in his sermon. All the stuff we're taught that we need to have in sermons for them to be effective. Hmm. Then comes maybe the most miraculous moment in Pentecost. And it is one of the things that I can tell you that a preacher loves to hear after giving a sermon. I love and appreciate hearing, oh, it was a nice sermon. Good sermon today. You did a good job. I appreciate that encouragement. But when the crowd heard Peter, they were deeply troubled They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? They were challenged. They were challenged by Peter's poor, pitiful sermon. How awesome is that? They were challenged. What do we need to do? Peter replied, Change your hearts and live. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God invites. Now, I have no explanation why, with this short, poorly delivered, poorly illustrated sermon, Peter's sermon, I don't know how it transformed this mocking mob, they're drunk, into brothers, what do we need to do? And therefore, into the first 
mass baptism in church history. Those who accepted Peter's message were told, were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people. 3,000 people were brought into the community that day. 3,000. In today's world, that's a huge number. Before the day was over, the church went from 120 to 3,000, over 3,000. And it wasn't because of Peter's pitiful sermon. It wasn't because the disciples had come up with the best marketing plan. It was because when they opened their mouths, they sounded like Jesus. It was because when they greeted people from all over, they welcomed them like Jesus. Because remember, when we start getting that way, ask ourselves the question, who would Jesus turn away? Who would Jesus reject? When children cried, they invited them into their laps. They didn't send them to the nursery. They invited them into their laps, just like Jesus. When the sick came near them, they held their hands like Jesus. They had begun doing things they had never thought they would do or be able to do. Things they had only seen Jesus do. They had been transformed in all their differences, in all their diversity. They were transformed into one body of Christ. And for me, that is truly the, mir the miracle of Pentecost. That is the Jesus way of life. That God would come to people as flawed and scared and uninspiring as the disciples and us and breathe into them new life and new inspiration and new hope. That God would knock down the doors and walls of fear and invade their space so thoroughly that they had no choice but to move out into the world to speak about the wonders of Jesus. To share the good news. Only God could look at the people that were huddled together in that room and believe that that poor, pitiful, uninspiring group of people could change the world. And I believe that on Pentecost, the question we need to ask is, do we still believe in a God who acts like that? Do we still believe in a God that looks at us and sees people he can work with? I believe so. I do. I believe that God still comes to us today. I believe that God doesn't always politely wait for us to check our calendars when he invites us to do something new. I don't believe he waits for us to have a business meeting about whether we should or should not do that. I believe that God sometimes just crashes right in and melts the walls off the place where we're gathered. I believe that God breathes new life into us when we are afraid. I believe that God delights in our differences, and he loves transforming us into one body of Christ. I believe that God created the church on that first Pentecost, and I believe that God continues to create and recreate and inspire and breathe new life into the church even now. So that in this church that God creates, every language is spoken. In this church God creates, every human is loved. In this church God creates, everyone is valued and given a seat at the table, no matter who they are. The Spirit-led church has been created not to gather behind locked doors or all in one place. We're not to just be here to worship 1030 on Sunday mornings. We're to go forth and worship and share the love of Jesus Christ when we leave this place. to do the things Jesus did, to unleash the wonder and beauty that we have experienced while we've been here. So we start to build the foundation of our faith, putting God first, accepting that relationship with Jesus Christ, worshiping him with our whole lives, and building a better community. And I believe if we start with these three points, we'll stay focused on what is most important in our life, put him first, and to help change our lives 
and the lives of our neighbor as well. Do people know Manatee Life Church as a transforming center for their community? Are we doing things with such enthusiasm and energy that the naysayers point? They point as we're coming out on Sunday mornings and comment or think to themselves, they got to be drunk. I pray that they do. For that provides us the opportunity to stand up like the Apostle Peter and proclaim with voices raised in praise, adoration, and love that Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And because Jesus is alive, I can live. You can live. Better put, because Jesus is alive, we can all live the Jesus way of life as one body of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you give us the faith to go where you go, to do what you do, to trust what you say, and to love how you love. We commit to following you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. And now receive this benediction. Let us go from this place, and as we do, inspire love. Embrace Christ. Engage the world and tell somebody about Manatee Life Church. Go in peace. Amen. Be sure to join us next week for week six of Learning the Jesus Way of Life. You can live stream our services at Manatee Life Church, a multicultural United Methodist community of faith in Bradenton, Florida, on YouTube. And we've got a link in the show notes, 1030 Eastern Time, each and every Sunday morning. Get social with us here at Soul Ramblings Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Those pages are the links to those pages, rather, are in the show notes of this episode. I want to thank you for the gift and privilege of your time today. And wherever you're listening today, if you would be oh so kind as to click subscribe, that way you never miss a new episode of Soul Ramblings Podcast. You know, it's hard to believe it's already the first week of June. This week, this year is just flying right on by. So as we bid you farewell for this week, Here is the last piece of advice. If you believe in goodness and if you value the approval of God, fix your minds on whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. Until next week on Soul Ramblings Podcast, I'm Jerry Wicker. Have a great week. Grace and peace. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production. Mm -hmm.